The latest statistics on the global HIV and AIDS epidemic published by the United Nations and the World Health Organization shows that there are currently more than 35 million people in the world living with HIV. Since the start of the epidemic, an estimated 36 million people have lost their lives to AIDS-related diseases. But there is hope. AIDS-related deaths have fallen 30% worldwide since the peak in 2005, and the annual number of new HIV infections has steadily declined in recent years, leading to an overall slowdown in the growth of the epidemic as well. One man has been at the forefront of the fight against the AIDS epidemic for more than 30 years. In 1981, he was a young, ambitious immunologist at the University of California in Los Angeles, and that's when he reported to the U.S. Centers for Disease Control the first five cases of what would soon come to be known as acquired immune deficiency syndrome, AIDS. Dr. Michael Gottlieb is one of the most well-known HIV and AIDS specialists in the world. He's considered by many a pioneer in the field, and he's still treating AIDS patients in his private practice. But he has also dedicated his life to bringing to an end HIV and AIDS. An associate clinical professor of medicine at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA, Dr. Gottlieb co-founded the American Foundation for AIDS Research, or AMFAR, with the late actress Elizabeth Taylor and Dr. Mathilde Krim. He is also the medical advisor to the board of the Global AIDS Interfaith Alliance. Welcome to the program. Great to have you here. You know, it's funny. Some people start their careers and they say, I'm going here. Um, AIDS came to you, though. I mean, it wasn't something like you said, I'm going to go and I'm going to go and discover this thing. That's right, Mike. It wasn't by design. It really happened in the course of normal activity at an academic medical center where you're seeing patients and teaching. And we saw this one patient, and it was a curious patient. Could have been something new, could have been something very ordinary, but it uh, intrigued us, and, and we studied this patient much further. So it's one patient at that point in time, and then you start getting a couple of more. Uh, talk to me about that, that, that step there, because the initial stages, you don't know what you're on top of, do you? Well, this patient was very interesting. Uh, you know, he was a gay man, and, and it wasn't clear that what he had had anything to do with his, his gender preference. Uh, but word kind of got out into the medical community here in Los Angeles, and, and doctors here sent us additional patients who they had been mulling over and considering what they might have, but hadn't come to any conclusion. And, of course, these patients turned out to be carbon copies of our very first patient, a young men in the early 30s with fevers, weight loss, and opportunistic infections. You know, once we got to three or four patients, we got to wondering whether this might be uh, the tip of the iceberg or something very big. And so we put out uh, questions to our colleagues who had large practices of gay men at, this time, at that time. And it turns out that they had many other young men suffering with uh, less severe uh, kind of indolent uh, uh, low-grade illnesses. So then you published the report. Was it a firestorm at that point, or, or what happened? Or did it a slow trickle? How would you describe those early years? Yeah, the phone started ringing, and we got reports from all over the country, New York, Miami, San Francisco. And CDC, of course, took it very seriously and, and started active surveillance. And in fact, a month later, published a second report uh, documenting 40-some cases, uh, very much like our first five. I remember, uh, I guess it was 1985, I was in uh, the Monterey Bay area, and Rock Hudson came up to see Doris Day. And it was the first time all of us got a look at him. Uh, and he was gaunt, he did not look well. Uh, but you, you treated him. Um, how important, how significant was his case and him coming out and, and talking about the disease, do you think? Well, I think uh, Rock Hudson was one of those uh, sensational events that became a tipping point in the HIV epidemic. Uh, the general public uh, uh, hadn't cared much prior to Rock. The press coverage was rather scant, and the government certainly hadn't mobilized to address uh, an emerging epidemic. And, after Rock Hudson, things changed significantly. Was that frustrating for people in the medical community like you that uh, for so long it just kind of languished? I really underestimated the amount of uh, antagonism that uh, existed amongst the general public and the government toward people affected by HIV. And uh, we were very frustrated. We, we were saying, here's this uh, epidemic that's killing people, and we don't have 
significant funding and we don't have leadership. Irvin Magic Johnson, another step in the phase of this whole uh, evolution. Uh, how important was his announcement? It was incredibly important. It was 1991. I think it was a bombshell, uh, something no one uh, expected. Uh, people were shocked. Uh, people loved and, and still love Magic Johnson. And it really helped advance the cause of some sort of empathy amongst the public uh, for people living with HIV. You were there in the trenches early on um, in the 80s. Magic's announcement comes in the 90s. Now it's two, 2014. Take us through the trajectory. What, what happens early on? What happens in the 90s? When do you really start to see a, a change? So the first cases are described in 81. And then uh, Rock Hudson is in 85, 86. Uh, AZT is developed in 1987. There's this glimmer of hope that something might work. But then there's not another drug until 1991. Mm. And then Magic, of course, announces in 1991. And then the next big breakthrough is the mid-90s, when we get a test called the viral load test that tells us kind of a barometer of how active the viral infection is. And that's a very big breakthrough, along with uh, the so-called cocktail therapy. The protease inhibitors get added to two of the earlier drugs. And that's when we begin to see some change in the number of deaths associated with AIDS. Trivada. Let's talk about that because it seems to be the key word out there of late. Uh, how important is it? How much of a breakthrough has it become, would you say? Well, Truvada is part of the cocktail. But what we're talking about here is separate use of Truvada as PrEP or pre-exposure prophylaxis. People who don't have HIV taking an HIV medication to prevent acquiring HIV. And it has been controversial, and I'm not sure why it's been as controversial as it has been. So in a sense, what you're talking about is inoculating people, and, and, and so the question becomes, why would anyone be opposed to something like that? Well, I think inoculation is a good, good word, prevention. It's kind of like a vaccine, but it's not a vaccine, of course. It's taking a medicine that might be somewhat toxic in the long run uh, when you don't have an illness, taking it as prevention. And condoms work, and condoms should be the first line of defense. But the fact of the matter is that there are some people who can't or won't use condoms, and yet they don't want to contract HIV. I mean, the obvious solution is to have a vaccine, and we don't have an HIV vaccine yet. And so something like Truvada or PrEP is a stopgap measure, something that can reduce the harm associated with ongoing high-risk sexual activity. You know, what's interesting, though, is uh, you and I had a chance to kind of visit before we, we started the program. And uh, the interesting thing is there are pockets in the world that look a lot like the world you saw in the 1980s. I mean, these drugs are out there. If I'm here in the United States or in the West, probably pretty easy to access. But other parts of the world, that's not the case, correct? In other parts of the world, people still die the same way they did here in the 1980s. Things are improving as a result of the uh, PEPFAR program. Uh, cheaper HIV medications are being made available in many developing countries. What more needs to be done, though, would you say, if you could wave a magic wand? Well, if I could wave a magic wand, it would be the uh, instant appearance of a vaccine, right. an effective vaccine because so many people uh, are at risk. And, and in this country alone, we have 60,000 new cases of HIV every year. Uh, and the situation in sub-Saharan Africa and in other developing countries is so much worse. And why is that? Why are we seeing such an epidemic in some regions like that? I mean, in, in the spread, would you say? Oh, it's such a complicated question. Yeah. Uh, it relates to uh, so many factors, so women's rights or lack thereof, uh, uh, sex industries, uh, poverty primarily, uh, the economic dependence of women on men in sub-Saharan Africa. And that's one of the things that we had tried to address you know, with uh, Gaia, an organization I'm associated with. Mm -hmm. You know, I guess, People get fixated on cure, and um, 
And, and it doesn't seem like there's cures anymore, that, that basically making people comfortable, making their lives last a little longer, but they're still going to have the disease. So I want to put the cure question to you. Do you think it's possible we will see a cure? Uh, for HIV, I think it is possible. Uh, it's a really tough problem. Uh, it's, it's the idea of extracting a virus that has integrated itself into the genetic machinery of the cell. As you'll recall, we, we have no cure for the common cold. And uh, tackling HIV, which is a virus that, that in some ways is vulnerable, but in other ways uh, very, very tricky, uh, is a real tall order. Well, thank you so much. It's been a delight talking to you. I really appreciate you stopping by full frame. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Millions of people around the world are living with the devastating physical and emotional symptoms of AIDS, but has the social stigma around the disease changed as public awareness about the epidemic has grown? We'll ask our panel in just a minute.